church. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. Y'all happy to be here up on a Wednesday night? No better place to be on church than Wednesday night. What a great decision by you. You got the night started off right. Are y'all ready to get going? Awesome. That mild response is really going to go over well tonight. We'll just uh, keep it nice and quiet. Hey, so glad you're here. Uh, Maybe you're new here. You know what I've seen? I've seen some new folks coming in on Wednesday nights. How awesome is that? Coming in and getting the word. We love coming midweek, getting fed God's word. So if you're new, if you're new-ish, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming back. Um, My name is Landon. I'm one of the executive pastors here on staff. So on behalf behalf of Pastor Nate and Evan, thanks for coming back. And getting the word tonight. We're going to get into it. It's going to be fun. Uh, Yeah, oh my gosh, yes. The word is fun. You know why the word is fun? Because it sets you free. Being not free stinks. And the word can set you free. So I'm excited to get into it tonight. I want to, I better get my notes. I am, I am not like Pastor Nate in that sense. That guy could go noteless for weeks. I will not go noteless at all tonight. Um, y'all want to hear a joke though? Too bad. No, I'm just kidding. I saw, I saw one earlier. This is a classic dad joke. What, what do you do with a sad astronaut? You give him space. <laughs> boo, this is why I don't do jokes. Boo you. Who booed me? <laughs> boo me, I'll boo you. There's another one I read. It's more of like a, uh, a joke joke, but uh, it was pretty funny. Oh, there you are. Uh, Justin, I'm going to... So I was reading this joke about, uh, it was an, uh, an elderly couple, grandparents, and when I think of elderly, I think of Justin. <laughs> I can say this, right? I've been saying this for like 20 years. We've been friends forever. He was 23. I'm like, dude, you're so old, right? So uh, it's a friendly thing we have. So instead of uh, using the, the names they had, I'm going to use Justin, and, and by association, April, sorry, you're going to go into this joke too. So Justin and April, these, these grandparents, they went to the fair for years, and he always wanted to do, Justin always wanted to do this helicopter ride. It was 50 bucks. But April was like, Justin, that, that ride is 50 bucks, and 50 bucks is 50 bucks. Right? We're not doing it. And so they do this. They come back another time. Uh, and, and the same thing the next year. Well, by this time, you know, he's like, he's 87 years old. He's like, April, it, I'm 87. Who knows if we come back? I may not have another year to come back to get to do this. And she was like, Justin, 50 bucks is still 50 bucks wasn't happening. Well, the pilot overheard her at this point, and she's like, hey, folks, I overheard what you were saying. Listen, what I can do is I want to take you up in the helicopter, and if you don't say anything, like if you don't say a word, then it's free of charge. But if you say one word, it'll be $50. And they're like, okay. So they agreed to it. They did it. And this, this pilot went up, and he gave, he gave them the what for. Like, he was doing all of his tricks and everything. He couldn't believe it. Like, you know, they're 87 years old. They didn't, they didn't make a peep. And so they landed, and he said, man, I, that, I gave you everything that I had. That was impressive that, that you didn't even crack. And, and Justin was like, uh, yeah, I was thinking about saying something when April fell out, but 50 bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> so, but I, it's a joke. Listen, Jesus is going to come back well before you're 87. Don't worry about it. Praise the Lord. Now you're in the mood to hear the word, right? All right. Um, you know what? One of the, one of the things that, um, sorry about that. One of the things that uh, you may have heard me said before, maybe you haven't, but one of the verses that really sticks out to me, and this is something that uh, God just, he, he really highlighted to me when I was younger, probably early 20s or something, but he, I knew that I was called to teach God's word in some capacity. You know that God has a calling for your life? And to me, like, I was, I was not in any position at all to teach God's Word in any capacity at that time. But God will call you for something that you may not feel like you're equipped for right now. But, but when you are faithful and you just do what God has you doing right then, uh, it turns out that now I'm in a place where I have the uh, opportunity to teach God's Word to you tonight. How amazing is that? That's amazing. And one of the verses that, that I'm passionate about is Second Tim- or 1 Timothy 2.4. And this is where we hear God... Uh, the Apostle Paul, through the Spirit, telling Timothy, God wants all people to be saved. Say all people. 
all people to be saved. And sometimes we can get hung up there, but there's a second part to this. And he wants them to come to a knowledge of the truth. I am very passionate about seeing God's people, once they become God's people, come to a full knowledge of the truth. Because there are a lot of God's people who aren't learning and growing and coming to a full knowledge of the truth. And therefore, they're not living a victorious life, the life that Jesus came to give them. And so we're just going to get into the Word tonight, and we're going to read some Scriptures. And I believe wholeheartedly that just reading the Scripture of God's Word can set you free tonight with whatever you may have come in here with. I believe that with all my heart. Um, One of the things that I like we've been doing a little bit recently, how many of you like uh, chicken nuggets, right? Oh, I'm sorry. If If you're part of the younger crowd, nuggies. Sorry. Nuggies. You like, oh, Juan. Juan likes nuggies. I got you. Okay. Here's some nuggies. You know what? When you come to church, when you hear the word, when you're feeding on the word yourself, there's just going to be things that God highlights to you, sticks out to you, and that you're going to feed on maybe more than other things at that time, right? I come to this church, you know where I get my nuggies from my notebook. So I just go on and I I chew on those nuggies a little bit more. And one of the ones, actually my mom, this was my mom, who, who I was the Landon who, thanks mom, that's cool. Now it just shows how old we all are now when this building wasn't even here. Awesome. Great. I was, I was like, man, I've got some, I was looking at now, I've got some gray hair. Now she just confirmed it. Now I just told you. Now it's a, like, you may not even be able to see it, but I told you, and now crap, I have gray hair. Yes. <laughs> Can we get over that? I know that was really hanging y'all up tonight. But one of the nuggies, she even mentioned it, and Pastor Nate said, I think two out of the last four services or something, is that you know that it is the goodness of the Lord that leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. You know, it shouldn't take a tragedy. It shouldn't take you telling someone that, that, that they're going to be judged. It is the goodness of the Lord that will lead men to repentance, that will lead men to the Lord. Yeah. It's his goodness. And I love in Psalms 23, you've probably heard this, uh, hopefully, before, but the Lord is my shepherd. You know that when the Lord is your shepherd, at the end of that verse it says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. If goodness and mercy are following you as a child of God, guess what should be happening? People should be being led to the Lord by just following you. Because it is the goodness of Lord that leads men. It's not the goodness of God that pushes men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Our lives should look like the goodness of God. And if they do, whether you think so or not, people will be led to repentance, led to the Lord that way. That's how our lives can be a living testimony. You want another nuggie? This one's just, you may not have heard this one. This is something that, this never happens to me, like never. I told Courtney about this the other day, but I don't, I don't typically have dreams or anything like this uh, as far as the word, and I don't even know if I was having a dream, but I woke up. It wasn't the middle of the night. It was just like early in the morning, which feels like the middle of the night sometimes, but it was, uh, and I don't even know what, it, what really, how it all came to be. It was just talking about, you know, sometimes I think uh, we steal from the Lord. It's kind of a weird thing to say or think, but that was just what I was thinking about. And I'm thinking, what do you, you know, I know that in the Bible, God says in Malachi, you've stolen from me. You're robbing me of tithes and offerings. How many of you have heard that in Malachi? So when, when we don't bring, when God says, The first part, the first 10%, the first fruits are mine. And when we keep those for ourselves, that's actually stealing from God because he said that that was his, right? So that's one way that we can steal from God. And so I was familiar with that. Um, You know another way that you can steal from God? What are some other things that the Lord says are his? How about vengeance? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Sometimes I think we, we think it's our job to get revenge or have vengeance on people who are maybe don't see the, the same way we do. You know, when you take that in your own hands, you're stealing from the Lord. Do you know that when you try to fight your battle on your own, you're stealing from God? The Bible says the battle is the Lord's. And so when I take from God what's his, I remove him from the, that equation in my life. I no longer have him in my battle because it's mine now. It's not his. Hey, just a, just a PSA for the people of God tonight. Let's not steal from God. How about that? Whatever God says is his, let's make sure that he keeps his. And guess what? 
he'll make sure that what you need, you're going to have. Right? I mean, I don't want to be in a battle by myself. I'd prefer him to fight my battle for me because he said he would. Right? Praise the Lord. There's another nuggie. Chew it up, swallow it. We're going to move on. All right. For those of you not writing it down, you're not doing anything with it. Y'all need to write stuff down. Just saying, that's how you get nuggets. Nuggets don't stay in your head. That would be weird. All right. Tonight, we are going to be talking about no condemnation. No condemnation. Um, We taught on this last year, last fall in our Bible school. We did a class on In Christ. And this was actually one of the sessions of that class. We were talking about no condemnation, no guilt, no shame. And, and I've, I've, I think I've probably taught about this, uh, you know, a few times in Bible school up here. And sometimes someone will get up here and we'll teach something that the Lord's speaking to us about, maybe something in our life, what's going on. And that's not really the case this time. The, you know, I, I've never really had it like this. But the Lord just brought this up to me that there's people, there's some people in here who need to hear this message tonight. You need to be set free from condemnation in your life. And this is something that can affect the most seasoned, the most spiritual Christian. You could be a very, this could be, this could affect my mom, someone who's been a Christian for a lot of years, who, who is seasoned, who you might consider spiritual. This can affect anyone. And the thing is, no one else may know that it's going on. And so I, I just think that there's probably people in here that are dealing with this And the thing about condemnation is that when we succumb to condemnation and when we allow it and guilt into our life on a regular basis, it brings shame in our lives and it keeps us in whatever cycle we really, really want to get out of. And so God wants you free from that tonight. And I believe that just reading his word, you're going to get set free tonight. Say, I want to get set free. Yes, you are. So let's get into it tonight. I want to open up to a scripture you may not have heard before. This is uh, the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. <laughs> Unless you've seen Tim Tebow play football, you haven't heard this verse, I'm sure. It's, it's, it's out there. We're going to read through verse 18, though. It says, For here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior and rescue it. So now there is no longer, say no longer, any condemnation for those who believe in him. But the unbeliever already lives under condemnation because they don't believe in the name of the only son of God. So we see very clearly here that Jesus did not come to condemn us. Jesus did not come to condemn you. He came to save you. So if Jesus didn't come to condemn us, yet we deal with condemnation then who did? Let's look in Revelations chapter 12, verse 10. It says, I heard a triumphant voice in heaven proclaiming, Now salvation and power are set in place, and the kingdom uh, reign of our God and the ruling authority of his anointed one are established. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, this is referencing Satan, he, he has relentlessly accused them day and night before our God. He's now been defeated, cast out. Once and for all. So the accuser of the brethren, the accuser is the one who brings condemnation to you and I. In John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So when we look at those job descriptions, the job description of Jesus and the job description of Satan, which one does it fit in where, who, who would bring condemnation? Satan, Right? Now, I know this is revelation, this is groundbreaking stuff. The God is good and the devil's bad, right? Yep. But, but if we know that, why do we put up with something that we know is of the devil and we just live with it in our life? See, sometimes we have to go back to who the source of something is for us to it really open our eyes and say, you know what, I don't need to deal with that anymore. That's straight from the devil. Yeah. So we need to identify the source of where something comes from. Condemnation comes from your enemy, my enemy, the devil. Condemnation brings guilt and eventually shame. Conviction, on the other hand, brings repentance and eventually change. And conviction is something that the Holy Spirit does. Condemnation will never, ever, ever produce a change in our lives that makes us look more like Jesus. Condemnation will not, cannot do that for you. It won't. Let's look at 1 John chapter 3. 
verse 20 and 21. It says, whenever our hearts make us feel guilty and remind us of our failures, we know that God is much greater and more merciful than our conscience. And he knows everything there is to know about us. I love this. When our conscience tries to justify the guilt that we feel for the wrong that we've done, God's wanting you to know that he's greater and more merciful than your own conscience is. You're trying to, your heart is trying to condemn you, but God is saying, I'm greater than your heart. I know everything that you've ever, ever done, and I'm going to be more merciful than you would want to be to yourself. Verse 21 says, my delightfully loved friends, when our hearts don't condemn us and our hearts shouldn't, if God's not condemning us when we've done wrong, our hearts shouldn't condemn us. We have a bold freedom to speak face to face with God. This is big right here. A bold freedom to speak face to face with God. One of the, I was reading, this is out of the Passion, and one of the footnotes in here, I want to read this footnote, listen to this. It says, there is a higher courtroom for the human heart. It is where grace is enthroned. The very worst that is in us is known by God, and he still showers mercy, love, and acceptance upon us. This is the greatness of God's grace. He sees beyond the sin of a moment and sees the holy affections of love in those who refuse to turn away from him. That is good. This is good news. The gospel is good news. It's good news. And it reminded me of Hebrews chapter 4. 15 and 16, we're going to read it. It says, we don't have a high priest talking about Jesus who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was was in all points, say all points, points. tempted as we are, yet without sin. You know that there's nothing that you've come up against in your life that Jesus didn't face? Jesus faced more in his three years of ministry than all of our lifetimes combined. You know how he experienced all the stuff that we've gone through, too. He, he experienced all those things, but, but without sin. But, and then he also experienced the actual result of those sin in his body on the cross. Yeah. For us. Yeah. It's amazing. So verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is, this is so awesome. This last verse was talking about we have a bold freedom to speak face-to-face to God. And in Hebrews here, it's talking about us coming boldly to the throne of grace. This is what our approach should be to God. Right here. Yeah. Our approach should not be that of one crawling back to him on our hands and knees. We can be on our hands and knees in worship and adoration of him, but it should not be in begging anything from him because this is how he tells us to enter right here. In fact, I wrote this down. Our approach to the throne, both in timeliness and demeanor, will determine if we're going to allow condemnation and guilt to set in or if we're going to receive the mercy and grace freely offered to us in time of need. This is very important. When we miss the mark, how many of you miss the mark every once in a while? When you miss the mark, the timeliness it takes for you to go straight to the throne of God and you're, the demeanor in which you do that will determine if you're going to put up with any condemnation or guilt in your life. Yeah. When, when I mess up, right when I mess up, I can say, Lord, I messed up. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you that I don't have to deal with condemnation. That's not who I am because I know who I am is the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm not going to take a moment to identify with what I've done. I'm going to take a, a moment now to identify who you said I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, I can approach your throne boldly. So I'm coming boldly. And I'm asking you for the mercy and grace that you said I could get right now in this time of need. Because your mercy, your mercy is what is amazing. It's new every morning. It's there for you every day. And your grace to help me right now, grace is God's empowerment. It's his power for you to overcome what you just did. It's the help right there in time of need. The things that you're facing, you do not have to be trapped in a vicious cycle of sin. Jesus has made a way out of that. There's hope. There's hope. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 16. Y'all good with these scriptures tonight? Good. Let's read them. uh, Romans 5, 16 through 17. And this free-flowing gift imparts to us much more than what was given to us through the one who sinned. Talking about Adam. For because of one transgression, we are all facing a death sentence with a verdict of guilty. But this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God, acquitted with the words, not guilty. Can someone say amen? Amen. 
Thank you, Jesus. Death once held us in its grip, and by the blunder of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. But now, say, but now. How much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in life, enjoying our regal freedom through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus, the Messiah? This is an amazing set of scriptures right here. Amazing. Righteousness is a gift to be received. It's not something to be earned. There's not varying degrees of righteousness. There's one righteousness. And you receive it as a free gift when you make Jesus the Lord of your life. This is amazing. That's why if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you can say with confidence, anytime, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I exchanged, when I placed my faith in Jesus, I exchanged all my sins for all of his righteousness. Very good news. Um, it was in one of these recent services, Pastor Nate says, we, and it may have been last Wednesday, talking about how important our tongue is, right? We know this from James 3. Uh, if I want to course correct my life, it's found right here in my mouth. Just like a bit in a horse's mouth, just like the rudder on a ship, so is our tongue that will steer our life, right? Your mouth will change your position, what you do with your mouth, right? So, uh, and, and we're taught well here. We're taught that our confession matters. You know, sometimes as Christians, and myself included, I'm talking to me here, uh, I know that my confession matters. I know that what I say matters. But it's sometimes it's like I almost, I think that it just matters when I want it to matter. This is how I can live my life where I know that this is true, but I'm talking like it's not true. You ever been, you ever been there? I know that my confession is important. I know that my life is steered by the direction that, that, that I want to go by what I say. And sometimes I'll end up places that I don't want to be at, and, and I wonder how I got there, and it was because I thought at that time when I said it, it didn't matter. It matters all the time what you say. All the time. And we're taught that, you know, just like Abraham, Abraham believed those things that be not as though they were, right? This is why, you know, we don't deny the, uh, the presence of sickness in our body. That's not what Christians do. I mean, some Christians do, but that's wrong. I'm not denying the presence of something in my body. What I'm doing is I'm deferring to a higher reality that Jesus, by his stripes on the cross, has made me whole. So I'm not in denial about what I'm dealing with. What I'm doing is I'm deferring to a higher reality of a gift that Jesus has given me. He allowed his body to be beaten and broken for my healing, and I'm not going to let that go to waste. I will not. And so we're taught that when, when you're feeling something that you shouldn't be feeling, when you have something creep up, when, when the stomach bug hits like it's hitting some people right now, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. He took in his body uh, sickness and infirmities, and he allowed himself to be beaten so that I could be made whole. So even though I feel a certain way, I'm saying something else. Even when there seems to be lack in my life, what I'm saying is my God supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory, right? So we're taught to believe those things that be not as though they already are. And so the, the way that we believe those things is we actually say it out loud. I believe this, and so that's what I'm going to say. It's out of the abundance of my heart that, that my mouth will speak. Right. You know, and sometimes when we're dealing with sin, when we're dealing with an addiction, when we're dealing with something, sometimes we talk about that, and, and, and or we, we've heard this just, just growing up, you know, in church, around church, religion, and we're taught to confess our sins. And sometimes we take that out of context, and so we think every time we sin, I did this as a, as a kid, every time I sinned, I needed to confess my sin just in case Jesus decided to come back. I wanted all my sins to be out there. How many of you are with me? Right? I repented. Every night, I repented. I'm like, if he's coming back tonight, like a thief in the night, that always scared the crud out of me. I'm like, why do you, Jesus, why do you got to be like a thief in the night? Just, right? This is what happens when you misinterpret the Bible, though is that it produces fear. All those things were done out of fear. God's word does not produce fear. Pastor said it this Sunday. If, if it's fear, it did not come from him. It did not originate with him. It didn't. And, and sometimes we're taught to confess our sins. When, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with something that I want to overcome, I don't need to confess my sins. I need to confess Jesus is Lord of my life. See, I don't confess my sins to get saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart, 
uh, or if you, uh, let's just read it real quick. You got Romans 10, 9, and 10? I don't, but I'm going to get it real quick. And I, I know it, but I, I want to read it because this is very important. That if you confess with what? Your mouth. That the Lord Jesus. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. If, if you confess with your mouth all of your sins and believe in your heart, that's not how you get saved. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So the same way that you got saved is the same way that you're going to overcome. You're going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Yes. Jesus is Lord. Yes. If you have aught with a brother or sister and you want to confess your sins one to another and clear that up, that's biblical. But going around confessing your sins, thinking that that's what's going to allow you to overcome that, is incorrect. You need to confess that Jesus is Lord. You need to confess who you are in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of my life. This sin has no power over me, has no hold on me, because of the finished work of Jesus. We're going to get into a little bit more of that. Listen, when you reign, when you reign, sin doesn't. So what happens when um, we miss the mark, there's an opportunity for this condemnation to come and for guilt to set in. And guilt, guilt is a crippling, it's crippling, it's paralyzing. It's one of the many tools that the enemy uh, employs to keep us from living a victorious life, to keep us from shining for Jesus, to keep us from, from being that one where goodness and mercy are following us all the days of our life and people are drawn to us right, is guilt. When you're living in guilt, it, it really, guilt, guilt is really just a sneaky way for us to pet our flesh. Like, I'm just going to lay it all out there. Guilt is a sneaky way for us to pet our flesh. And like all sin, like all sin, it finds its root in pride because it exalts what I've done over what Jesus has done for me. When I give in to guilt, I'm saying, God, what I've done is bigger, and I'm, va- I'm placing more value on it than what you've done for me. Right. And, it, and really, it's an ugly thing because it, it just gives us to self-pity. Self-pity is the ugliest thing ever. Yeah. It is the most unattractive thing ever. Self-pity. Feeling sorry for oneself. We may talk about that later. I heard Pastor Bill Johnson say, say it this way before. Guilt and shame will give you a false sense of spirituality. They'll create a sense of humility, but they won't give you access to what humility gives, gives you access to. And so a lot of Christians think it's right for me to feel a certain sense of guilt for what I've done because I need to, I need to learn my lesson. I need to change my ways. Guilt will not empower you to change your ways. It will keep you where you're at. It will keep you locked up where you're at. That's right. Humility will allow grace. We just talked about grace. This is God's power for you. Humility will allow a grace to flow into your life, whereas guilt will just allow more devilish things to flow into your life. Yeah. Let's read this in 1 Peter 5, uh, 5 through 7. And it also says this in Proverbs 3.34 and um, in James chapter 4 as well. So three different places. It says... Uh, in the middle of the verse, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. So when true humility is on display, God's grace is there for us. God's power is there for us. Let's keep reading. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. I think it was important to keep reading here, you know, when God's telling us, sometimes we want to know, what does it look like to humble myself? You know, one of the main ways we humble ourselves is we bring ourselves underneath what God's word says. I humble myself, and I think this, but I'm going to take what I think, and I'm going to place it underneath of what God thinks. Right? Right? And, you know, it tells us right here as it kept going, what humility would do is give all its worries to God, because God's already paid the price. Guilt hangs on to those worries because it acts like there's still a price to be paid, right? So we, we kind of see a way that, that we can humble ourselves uh, as they keep talking about in this verse. Give all your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. 
He's already made a way for those things. When we decide to hang on to our cares and worries, it, again, pride's coming in, pride's coming in like, you, like I can deal with it on my own. God, I can deal with this on my own. I don't need to give it to you. And that's a lie because we cannot. We cannot. So here, here's the problem with, with giving in to guilt even a little bit. It, Proverbs 11, verse 2 says, when pride comes, and we talked about how guilt and pride are right there because but, but, pride is the root of all sin, and guilt is really just a form of that because it's valuing self over what Jesus has done, right? So when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. So when we give in to guilt long enough, that pride begins to form shame in our life. And really the best way to describe shame or to differentiate between shame and guilt, shame is guilt in diapers. This is what shame is. Shame is just a baby form of guilt. When uh, the longer that I allow guilt to grow and stay there without being addressed, it's going to turn into shame. And it's no longer about what I've done, it's about who I've become. I'm now, I'm now in shame and I'm letting something form my identity that's actually not part of my identity at all. Yeah. And it's going to affect the behaviors, yeah. my behaviors, and how I live my life. Sure. And that is not what God wants. In Genesis 2, we don't even, you don't have to turn there. In Genesis 2, we know in the, in the beginning where Adam and Eve, they were both naked and they were not ashamed, right? They felt no shame. When did they feel shame? They felt shame the moment they sinned, the Bible says, their eyes were open and they felt shame. Shame always follows sin. It's always followed by guilt or sin. I want to read some good news to you, though. Are you all ready? Romans chapter 3, 21 through 24. It says, but now. Oh, I love buts in the Bible. But now. Independently of the law, the righteousness of God is tangible and brought to light through Jesus, the anointed one. This is the righteousness that the scriptures prophesied would come. It is God's righteousness made visible through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And now all who believe in him receive that gift. For there is really no difference between us, for we have all sinned or in need of the glory of God. How many of you have heard that? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What, I, I don't understand how sometimes that became the end of the, where we wanted to read. Let's keep reading. Yet, through his powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives away his righteousness. His gift of love and favor now cascades over us, all because of Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated us from the guilt, the punishment, and the power of sin. I want you to leave this up here. Jesus has liberated us from the guilt of sin, the punishment of sin, and the power of sin. This has changed everything. Everything. Oh, I love, I love this verse. Jesus did it all. We, Pastor talked about this on Sunday. One of, one of the four things we're talking about, Jesus finished it all at Calvary. At Calvary, it was all finished. He has now liberated us from the guilt of sin. Listen, you don't have to fear the punishment of sin. Jesus took that on for you. Your sins will not be punished. If you've placed your faith in Christ, your sins will not be punished. They were punished in Jesus. You do not have to experience guilt because of what you've done wrong. Jesus experienced that for you. The power of sin, you have been liberated from that. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 55 through 57. So death, tell me, where is your victory? Tell me, death, where is your sting? It is sin that gives death its sting. Listen to this. Let's follow, let's follow the scriptures here. If sin gives death its sting, what, Jesus has liberated me from death. And it's the law that gives sin its power. Wait a second. Jesus liberated me from the power of sin. What is the power of sin? The, the law is what gives sin its power. The law. You're like, I'm like the Ten Commandments. Like, that's, that, that's of God. How does that give sin its power? That's what the Bible tells us. And we can't get into all of it tonight, but the Bible actually calls the, the law, the Ten Commandments, the ministry of death. Whereas Jesus, when he ushered us into this dispensation of grace, it's called the ministry of righteousness. 
this is why y'all should go to Bible school, because we get in deep here. This stuff is, I mean, this will change your life. The power of sin was the law. It was in us trying to do everything right to work our way towards God, and that's where sin thrived. But Jesus has liberated us from that. The, uh, the book that, that we used in, in, the, uh, in that class last year, the In Christ book, is one of my favorites. It's by Joseph Prince. It's called Destined to Reign. This is an amazing book. If I can make anyone do anything, I would make them read this book. Destined to Reign by Joseph Prince. And there's a chapter in there called Pure Grace. And, and in this chapter, he talks about how pure grace was on display in the Old Testament. And typically, we don't think that. You know, we think Old Testament, New Testament, this was the, this was the law. Then Jesus came, grace came, right? But there, were, there was a part in the Old Testament where, where the children of Israel, God's people, were living in pure grace. And it was this time when he delivered them out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt, out of slavery. And, and they, they crossed the Red Sea. Uh, you know, you, may, you know the story. You've seen Moses. You've, you've heard this, right? And what were, what were the people of Israel famous for during this time? Complaining and murmuring. They complained when they got set free and they left Egypt. The Bible says they left with all of the wealth of Egypt. All of the wealth. And you can go back and look. There was not one feeble or sick among them. So not one person died. I mean, we're talking about millions of people. Not one person died, but not even one person was feeble or sick among them. Among them and they're walking out of Egypt with all of its wealth. Then God parts a sea for them, and they walk through on dry ground. Say dry ground. Dry ground. Dry ground. And then God drowns their enemies in that same sea. And then on the other side of that, not too far from there, they find another way to complain that God brought us out here to die. He, he, he led them by night. He led them by day. Right? He rained down manna from heaven. He, he had water come out of a rock. He made the bitter water sweet. Complain, 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 complain. That in the midst of their complaining, they were living under pure grace. It had nothing to do with what they did, how they lived. Everything that God did, he did because of his goodness and his grace. Regardless of what they did. And here, here was the changing point right here. They come, and, and, and they're at Mount Sinai, and Moses is up on the mountain, right? And, and the people say, or the people say, just, and the Bible reads that everything that, God's, everything that God says to do, will do it, right? And so we read that in our English Bible, but in, in Hebrew, what they're really saying is, it's a statement of pride. They're saying, we'll do, just tell us what to do. We'll do, we can do, we are way, well able to do whatever God tells us to do. And so they're essentially saying, God, we're, we're wanting to work our way for, for what we get and what you do for us. So we're going to, and this is done, like this doesn't make sense to our minds. We're going to do away with everything that you've done for us. I'd rather earn. I'd rather earn and work my way for it. And so at that time, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And he makes a, a, a really cool um, uh, comment here that, that you can read in Scripture um, the, right when this happened, like literally right when this happened, Moses is up there. They're, they're telling Aaron to make, like, where is, where is Moses? Let You fashion a God for us that we can worship. And I was reading today, like, Aaron was just really quick to do it. All right, bring me, bring me all your earrings and stuff. Melt them down, build an idol here. Here's the, your God to worship. So Moses comes down and finds this, and you know that day, the day, the day that the people said that, when, when the law was given, the Ten Commandments were coming down, Moses came down and saw this, he dropped them, the, the, the tablets got cracked, remember? Right? This is, in Bible. This is in, the, in the Bible. He comes down, and that day, Moses said, you know, he, he said, who's for the Lord? And, and the Levites, I, I believe, and, uh, they came and were for the Lord, and they went, and Moses commanded them. They slaughtered 3,000 men that day. Until that time, until that time, not one was even sick or feeble among them. And that day, that day, 3,000 of them died. This was 50 days after they were set out of Egypt. 50 days after Passover is Pentecost. Exactly 50 days. 
And, and, you know, we go to the New Testament side, 50 days after Passover, they're in the upper room and and Pentecost comes. That same day, 3,000 men were added, 3,000 people were added to the Lord's family that day. This is the difference between the law and grace. The law demands righteousness from you, whereas grace imparts righteousness from you. The law said, do this, but it doesn't do anything to help. Grace empowers you to do it. It's very important for us to understand the dispensation in which we're living. Um, Some people are down on the message of grace. If you're down on the message of grace, you're down on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says Jesus was full of grace and truth. If you're full of something, you are that something. He is grace. He is truth. He is the gospel of grace. And I don't have time to get into this, but I will just for a second, because some people get caught up. If you tell people that it's by grace, then that gives them a license to go sin. You've heard this before, right? That is so unbelievably untrue. Grace is the very thing that will set you free from sin. Anyone who has experienced Jesus, anyone who has given their life to Jesus and loves Jesus, they are not thinking about ways to go out and sin. That is the absolute furthest thing from their mind. Anyone who says that and then lives that way, they have not experienced Jesus. This is good news. Jesus fulfilled the law, the very thing that gave sin its strength. And then he ushered us into this dispensation of grace. Let's continue in Romans here with Paul. In uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 18, it says, For I know that nothing good lives within the flesh of my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right are within me, but willpower is not enough to accomplish it. Your willpower will never be enough for you to do what is right. But guess whose willpower is? His is enough. And how do we get our will to match his will? I'm going to say what he says. My mouth changes my position. I will say what God says about me. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. We're going to read through uh, chapter 8 here, which isn't weird because, you know, man's the one who added all these chapters and numbers. So we're going to kind of keep reading through it. Y'all stay with me, all right? Let's read on the screen. What an agonizing situation I'm in, Paul said. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? I give all my thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So if left to myself, the flesh is aligned with the law of sin, but now my renewed mind is fixed on and submitted to God's righteous principles. So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. For the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Yet God sent us his son in human form to identify with human weakness. Clothed with humanity, God's son gave his body to be the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. And we are free to live not according to our flesh, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Um, In Romans chapter 8 verse 1, you may have heard this before. I want to read it from the New King James. It says, there's therefore now, how many of you have heard it this way? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in this translation, it says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so when I was, you know, kind of when when I was learning about some of these things, and I'm like, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I was learning about the righteousness of God and what the and the grace of Jesus. And and, and I get to this scripture and I see, and it says in that second part, it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And that tripped me up because why is that why is that even there? Because Now what that's telling me is, well, I've got to walk according to the Spirit, not to the flesh, in order for no condemnation to come. Right? That's how how I read that. So if I walk according to the flesh, condemnation will come. But in in studying this, in the original transcripts, that verse was not even added. It was added by translators. 
which isn't too surprising to me because when I, want to read, when I would have read that, I might have thought the same thing too, but this is how good the grace of God really is. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. That's it. That's it. Feeling condemned, feeling guilty, um, living with any sense of shame is not biblical. It's not healthy. Do you know that um, uh, these things, guilt and shame, they, they can lead to stress, depression, things that bring on like actual physical symptoms in your life. Um, I read this actually from the Complete Life Encyclopedia. It says, shame is the issue that drives almost every compulsive, self-defeating behavior known to the human race. Shame is at the root of all addictions. It may be forgotten, hidden, or disguised, but the shame is there, it's real, and it drives our behavior. Listen, guys, Romans 3.24, if Jesus has liberated us from the guilt of sin, the punishment of sin, and the power of sin, we need to get shame out of our lives and out of our mouths. Like our vocabulary, our nonverbals should never communicate to anyone, shame on you. You should be ashamed of yourself. You know what we're doing when we say that? If the strength of sin is the law, and guilt and shame are what follow sin, we're just putting people back under the law when we're declaring shame on them. We're doing the work of the law, but, but instead, we, need to, we, we can look at Jesus. Jesus has liberated us from the guilt, the punishment, and the power of sin. Put another way, let's say it like this, feeling bad about yourself is at the core, it's a devilish thing. You know, and if we wanted to be a little more blunt, feeling bad about yourself is not humility in any way. It's stupidity in every way. We're only hurting ourselves when we feel bad for ourselves. Yeah. True humility places itself under the truth of God's word yeah. instead of taking on a somber tone or state because we're introspective, having placed ourselves under the quality of our own performance. Yeah. Yeah. True, hum- true humility places us under the truth of God's word. I heard Chris Vallotton say this. He said, every time you think bad about yourself, You're insulting the God who made you. God the Father made you. Jesus was the model, and you're the painting. Man, we if if God, if Jesus took care of the guilt of sin, the power of sin, and the punishment of it, why are we still dealing with guilt? Guilt should not be a part of our lives. It is not helpful to us in any way. Knowing who you are in Christ is the answer. Church, let me tell you, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are, say it, I am the righteousness of God God in Christ. Christ. And I want to, let's let's just confess this whole thing together. I wrote a confession down. Repeat this after me. I am in Christ. I am am free from guilt and condemnation. condemnation. I don't look to my own performance, performance. but to Jesus' performance. Condemnation, guilt, and shame have no hold on me because I am in Christ. I'm in Christ. Thank you, Lord. You know, just a practical thing. You know, if if you stopped reading your Bible for a few days, you shouldn't feel guilty about it. You should just feel hungry. Get Guilt, guilt has no place in my life. It will not motivate me to do the right thing, ever. Grace changes our desires so we're internally motivated instead of externally restrained by rules. Grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand tonight. I just want to pray over you, and if, if you've been dealing with guilt, if you've been dealing, even if it's gone deeper, and, and you're living, you just feel shame has, has just defined you, 
and it's really closed you off to living your life the way you need to live it, I want you to know there's freedom for you here tonight. There's freedom in God's word. Jesus paid the price for that. Jesus, his, his finished work was just not your ticket to heaven. It was so, so much more. Let's bow our heads and pray. I just want to pray over you. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for sending Jesus, your only son, for us. Thank you that you sent him not to condemn us, but to save us. We receive the finished work at Calvary. Everything that it entails, we, we say right now, it's, it's ours. It's ours. Thank you, Jesus, that you liberated us from the power of sin, the guilt of sin, the punishment of sin. Thank you that it's not something that controls us any longer because we know who we are in you. We are your righteousness, Jesus. We've received your free gift of righteousness. Thank you for paying the price that we couldn't pay. Thank you for giving us your righteousness, which we could never get any other way. Father, I just pray for these people right now. If, if there's any, any sense of, of, of just not knowing their identity in you, I thank you for revelation knowledge, flooding the eyes of their understanding, flooding their hearts to know who they are in you. Thank you, Lord. That even when we mess up, we can get up, look up, look straight to you and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I'm coming to you on the basis of your word, boldly, full of confidence, looking straight, looking at you face to face. Thank you for your mercy. I'm asking you for your grace to overcome this obstacle in my life. Thank you that there is more than enough grace to overcome. Thank you, Lord. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word sets us free. Thank you that your word keeps us free. We love you. We honor you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. It's your name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Man, God's word's good. I don't care if you didn't get anything out of it tonight. I sure did. God's word is just that good. This is why God's word is alive. I've fed on that word before, but you know what? It didn't do me much good before I was feeding on it again this week. It did for a time, but, 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 but faith is hearing God's word, not having heard God's word, right? We need to hear this. This is why we stress we're not trying to, we're not trying to make it hard on you to take notes in church. We are trying to, to get you to see this is where life is. What God is saying in the place God has called you, there is life. Why would you, why would you go get a prescription from a doctor knowing 100% it would take care of what you have if you don't actually take it? Take what God is giving you. Stop treating it like, well, I'll just hear it again. No, you won't. It's not, if it's not important enough to write down or to take a note of, it's not important to you. Man, and I don't want to end the night on this. Praise the Lord. God's word is good. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, man, we, we've, got to, we've got to take God at his word. And to take God at his word, I need to do more than just come and look and hear like it's going to feed me some more later on. Praise God. You're free. You're free. One more time. Say, I am the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus. Yes, you are. All right. Oh, let's say something. Go for it. Hello? Oh, I'm on. I say this to my Bible school students all the time, and I thought this was a perfect time to say it. He actually said it there at the end. But God's word is spirit and life. That's what his word tells us. Amen? John Osteen said that... We know that his word is alive and working and producing life on the inside of us when every time we hear a word, it thrills us. It thrills us. His word is spirit and life. So no matter how many times I hear that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that sin does not dominate me anymore because I'm in Christ. If it does not thrill me, 
If it does not uh, excite me, if there's not joy coming up, bubbling up out of out of me when I hear those words, what that tells me is that, Lord, I need some light and I need revelation because what I just sat and listened to, I've heard before. And so it's not really producing the life in me that the Word says that it should be producing in me. Amen? Every time, and we get good word here, family. We get good word here. Sundays and Wednesdays, Monday nights, we get good word. And no matter how many times we hear a word, no matter how many times I hear, for God so loved me that he gave his son for me. If that doesn't thrill me, then I haven't seen Jesus. I haven't experienced his grace. I haven't experienced the truth of that word. Amen. His word thrills us. It produces life in us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You done? We love you. Good night. You're blessed. You're the righteousness of God in Christ.